I, it's it's kind of interesting. We've got um, all kinds of changes. We're in a very interesting period of time for my work. A lot of it is um, uh, based on the. A lot of my work is based on volume of language around particular contexts and how we get at it. And ever since probably June of last year, the level of the volume in the language and the level of emotional intensity is way up. And so it's the emotional intensity that drives the prescient component of our stuff. So it's been um, a sort of a rich harvest for us because everybody's all whipped up. One of the reasons that I think everybody's all whipped up is this energy, unknown energy from space business. And uh, uh, we're, we've been getting the idea of a... Uh, from 1997, when I first did the very first run here, I uh, got back, oh, I think, maybe 9 million data items in that very first one. Uh, it's not uncommon for me now for the servers to process through, you know, um, uh, two and three hundred million now, um, because we have social media primarily. Uh, there weren't that many sources back in the uh, late 90s, but even back then, I, one of the first things that I got in the very first run that shocked me was the conjunction of the word sun and disease. And the disease was not fully um, uh, fully formed in the lexicon. So I knew that there was a that it was a substitution because I'd have rigged this part of my code where if I ran into too many unknowns, it would take a word of the same emotional um, context and the same emotional duration and the same emotional uh, intensity get those three words, or one word, could be one word, it could also be different, three, and then go to the lexicon and retrieve those and bring it back. And uh, that was just my way of saying in the code, okay, you've got this far, don't fail, uh, or fail gracefully and go get a substitute and then tell me we've done a substitute. And so uh, I kept getting sun disease over the years, and well, we're there now relative to how humans think about the sun. Uh, we've been, uh, in the Western world, we've been... Um, uh, heaped with bullshit these past 20 plus years about uh, global warming uh, for people's uh, personal gain and for other who knows what other weird reasons. And now we're going to get to a, a level of reality where we start understanding what's going on with our weather and how it relates directly to the sun and how the sun is not what we've been told. So, for instance, you'll find a lot of people uh, that think that such things as a Dyson sphere can exist. And in fact, you'll get some people that will just be outraged by what I'm about to say, but uh, because they think there's, they've actually discovered a, um, an alien uh, social order some distance away, and the weird pattern of light we're getting from it, uh, according to even people at NASA, must be this civilization constructing a Dyson sphere around their sun. The idea of a Dyson sphere is that we took all of the material of all of the planets, uh, in our solar system, and we flatten them all out into a big, thin sheet metal, we could make a giant, giant ball with the sun in the middle, and that that would give us far more room to live in on the inside of that sphere than exists on all the planets around here now. So if we had filled up all the planets with people, this would be a way to flatten out all the planets, and, uh, you know, we'd all hang around in space, presumably, while this is happening, and they'd flatten out all the planets and surround our sun, and then we wouldn't lose any solar energy. It would all be 100% trapped, and we could use it, and we'd you know, life would be good, birds would sing, and so on. Awesome. And, well, that's that's the idea of a Dyson sphere, okay, uh, that was promulgated by this guy Dyson, who was a physicist, and he was brilliant, he won all kinds of awards, and his kid went on to develop um, uh, badarkas up here in the northwest, west, which are a form of a soft kayak that I actually use, a really cool kayak so that's paint on canvas, and I like his kid, but the Dyson, the, the physicist, was 100% wrong, because see, here's the problem. Uh, that presumes it has one fatal flaw, one uh, instantly a visible fatal flaw, if you're aware of what's going on, and that presumes that the sun is a nuclear-powered uh, something, that it is self-energizing, that it uh, makes its own energy and, and will do so until all of its matter has been consumed. Many people in the scientific community actually think the sun is a giant ball of hydrogen that because of gravity compressed itself to where it caught on fire at a nuclear level, and we've all been toasting marshmallows to that ever since. <laughs> and and, and that's, that's not the case. The sun is not nuclear. Any, any social order that could build a Dyson sphere would not, simply because they would recognize, as a, a lot of smart people on Earth do, um, and some of them told me this, that the uh, sun is not a nuclear reactor. It is, in fact, a ball of ferrite and uh, copper. The ferrite is a form of iron. 
and uh, it's being pushed through space by some mechanism that we're not able to determine at this stage at the rate of 70,000 kilometers per second. The fact that it's going through space at that rate, and space is not a vacuum, not where the sun is, because we're all back here trailing behind it like comets. And so the, here you have the sun going through space, dragging us behind it. We're in a vacuum because we're behind the sun. The sun's out here in what they call the interstellar medium. And the interstellar media is flowing around this giant ball of, of iron and copper and other metals and gets it all heated up because of the plasma effect. So if you really understand what's going on, the sun is actually very close to the rounded tip of a TIG torch uh, tungsten as you're going to go and torch on some aluminum. It only exists there. Uh, the, the plasma charge that you use to uh, weld aluminum only exists because of the proximity of all of this stuff. And then you remove the torch back, everything falls apart, the electricity goes away, the ionized gas goes away, it can't, it's not concentrated enough, and that's very much the same effect that's going on with the sun. <coughs> so, obviously, first thing, we've never been to the other side of the sun, we've never even orbited around its equator, because it's moving 70,000 70, kilometers, you know, uh, a second uh, away from us. And we're just lucky it's dragging us along. And so, you could never build a Dyson sphere around the sun. Halley's Comet can never find the Sun if it ever left our solar system. No comet could ever return on any periodic basis whatsoever because our Sun is moving so fast. It, if it came back to where the Sun was, we're long gone. So, ergo, all comets are trapped within our solar system along with us. Uh, many of these things are, are evident if you understand that the Sun is not a nuclear reactor. Uh, that being the case, then we can make some um, interesting observations about this. The sun is now dropping down from 5,000 degrees Kelvin centigrade. Uh, no, no, I think it's Kelvin. Uh, down to 3,000 uh, or thereabouts, which is like the low medium intensity for the sun. So not only is our Earth's orbit, such as it is back here, uh, being affected by the orbit of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, making it a, an oblate spheroid, drawing us further away from the sun and its heat, thus causing a, a, a solar minimum or, or a, a minimum ice age. Uh, but we also have the, the issue of the sun itself reducing its energy at that same time. So we're likely in for a big ice age. But there's a side effect of this. And the side effect is uh, an interesting wrinkle if you think about it from the woo-woo perspective and the quantum computers. And the side effect is that the plasma, the electric arc that is around the sun all the time that we perceive of as this nuclear-like fire that gives us light, that plasma is no longer acting as this altering uh, field for the energies that are flowing around the sun that it's pushing through. Thus, a lot of those energies are coming to us now much more full, if you will, much more or l much less moderated by the sun itself. Uh, and so we will uh, necessarily experience as humans, uh, in a sensory way, experience uh, the, the coming temporal uh, period, the coming time period, in an entirely different fashion than has been experienced in the past. And so we may be on the cusp of one of those periods of time. And, and I can think of a period of time back in what we might think of as ancient Greece, uh, close to around the year 12 or so, and previous to that, we find that this, the, um, all of the writing, all the literature, all the painting, everything described the waters around Greece as being wine-like, the color of wine, purple. And something happened, and it altered color on this planet. And we can almost pinpoint a time just based on certain cultures relative to this. And we may be in such a period of time now where the uh, energy fields are such that fundamental native properties of what we considered our reality as being in our reality as being immutable will turn out to be very mutable indeed, simply because things like the sun are changing. You know, it used to be when I grew up, you know, the sun was yellow. So we were going through a period of space. Uh, an area of space there that created uh, a yellow plasma. Now we're going through stuff that's much denser and it's creating this, um, uh, this uh, very much hot white plasma. Uh, the expectation by the Russians is that we may enter a period of time when we get to blue-white, in which case that might be very um, non-harmonious for humans. So with that said, if I take my telescope and I look at the sun with, I've got a really cool solar filter that gets rid of over 99% of the sun's light so you can look at it and it looks orange when I look at it with the, the telescope I do remember the sun used to be yellow like you said also totally and now you look at it and it's almost like this white it's so intense if you almost accidentally even glance at it sometimes it's like oh 
And well, it's been blinding animals. It's so intense. Never did that in my youth. Jeez, that's that's incredible. And what I wonder is if it's the actual atmosphere more than the the sun sometimes because. No, I remember you saying back in 2003 something happened to the atmosphere, and Correct. it seems like the chemtrails that I see sprayed on a regular basis, especially in Col it seems like Colorado gets sprayed extremely intense. I know in the northwest it does also. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at the atmosphere, and it's not that deep aqua blue anymore. It's like the synthetic transhuman artificial construct on the water. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I hear man. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, the, what the ha blue happened? Is different. So what uh, happened in 2003? That was a period of time when, okay, the Russians started talking about the um, uh, different area of space that the sun is moving into, and they were discussing this in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, so they were aware of it then. So sometime around 2003, we hit some kind of a something in that space, and a series of uh, changes occurred in the sun, one of which was the reduction uh, uh, temporarily of the protection that we receive from these energies from space, and the Earth took a big hit. Banda Achi, uh, earthquake occurred at that time. Giant tsunami killed 300,000 people and uh, uh, devastated the entire area of India, Malaysia, and so on. Uh, and at the same time, we lost 15% uh, of the upper atmosphere. And this is not the first time such a thing has occurred, that we've lost uh, big chunks of the atmosphere that way. And so this, the atmosphere is actually not as deep as it used to be, and plus, we've got all these uh, cars running around using up the oxygen a lot, so the composition has changed, um, but not enough to cause global warming. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that the oxygen balance is slightly different, which so it's going to alter the characteristics when you look up to the uh, sky day or night. You're not going to see the deep blue that you might see even today if you go back and look at some of the... Uh, uh, movies from the 40s and the 50s as they were just getting into color. Those deep, rich colors, insofar as the outdoor pictures, are not an effect, in most cases, of the coloring process, so much as they are that we, we had a different planet then. You were filming under a yellow sun, and you had a much deeper, bluer sky. And uh, the effect is going to be to create, you know, um, different resonance and other colors, so you're going to get a different richness than you see now with this sort of, I guess I don't have to almost say pastel effect. Uh, so the richness uh, or hue has been altered within uh, a lot of the color on the planet as a result of what's going on in the atmosphere. And, ag and again, this is all related to the sun. So they may be monkeying about with CERN, trying to correct it. Man, that would be screwy if that was the case. Chemtrails might indeed be an attempt to correct what's going on with the atmosphere. They seem to really have ramped the things up recently, uh, especially around, uh, as you say, Colorado, but also up here in the northwest and in, in all along the west coast. When we're not getting hit by these massive rainstorms, we're getting, um, and in fact, even when those are here, you can sometimes hear the planes up above them spraying. Right. So, it, you know, it, I don't know what their uh, rationale is for that. They may be thinking that they're protecting all life from this extra solar energy. And there is some uh, historical justification for that view that can be presented because there's caves all around the planet that have drawings of humans um, uh, in the cave, sticking sticks and twigs and stuff outside the cave and having those sticks and, and so on catch fire, as though solar radiation alone at particular times of the day were enough to ignite fires. And in, in some of these cave paintings, you see uh, depictions of vast forests that are burning. Uh, so there's, you know, there is some small justification to think that there might have been a period of time 40, 50, 60,000 years ago where we had similar solar conditions where it was dangerous to be out in the sun. And we also know that the um, you can't really go by such things really because of the commercial impact of it, but we know that there's been a, um, a, a coincident, uh, non-lagging coincident push for sunscreen as the sun changed. So, so uh, let me be clear about that. The normal course of events, if we weren't paying attention, if we weren't uh, trying to script things and manage things as a social order, we'd just sort of bumble along and, oh yeah, oh, the sun's changed. And then a few years later, we'd say, wow, damn, we're getting burned. Maybe we'd better invent sunscreen. Uh, in this case, we didn't have that happen. As the sun was diminishing in its yellow and brightening and white, they were already building a sunscreen uh, industry, if you will, in in many different areas. Uh, now, I'm, I oppose the sunscreens because of the cancer relations uh, to the chemicals they've got in them, uh, and the and also the idea that you're going to in any way allow a sunscreen to moderate the effects of the sun that we're seeing now is quite ludicrous. And you'll also note that the 
impetus, the emo or the um, a financial uh, backing to sunscreen is a big push around the planet, especially in the uh, light-skinned, melanin-deprived peoples, is way down. It's like they're not really pushing that stuff anymore. And there, so there's been a change in somebody's attitude about how they're going to address some of this stuff. Uh, it's my contention that as part of going into the uh, ice age that I think we're heading into, that we're going to see extremely uh, harsh solar conditions uh, that we'll have to be prepared to deal with. This will be a much more intense ultraviolet to the point where we may end up having to wear um, special ultraviolet uh, sunglasses constantly uh, and that, you know, even a few minutes exposure could be quite harmful. So uh, those kind of conditions may well exist as we go forward. There's some record in historical uh, myths that indeed that was the case. You see this in, in situations of um, like the Inuit known as the dinglet up here in Alaska, because uh, these people uh, invented UV sunglasses out of fish skin, and that was really all they had in the way of resources, and uh, uh, it was quite effective. Uh, and of course, you can say, oh, well, you know, uh, they needed to invent it because they live in um, uh, an icy, glacy, uh, 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 icy, glaring environment. And that while that's true, the people that actually invented it did not live in that environment, but were coastal dwellers that live in areas much uh, that I have here, which is, you know, um, uh, the conifer species of evergreen trees. And it's just that when they got out of, from underneath those trees, the ultraviolet was so harsh out on the water where they uh, obtained most of their living that they needed something to protect themselves. So they invented these really cool uh, fish skin goggles that were opaque with minute little uh, micro perforations that allowed you just an incredible distance view and even up close. Yeah, I'll bet those smelt wonderful. I'll bet you the <laughs> oh, taste. Hey, you're, you're really wearing, hungry. Yeah, you're wearing a Man. suit out of, uh, made out of fish skins and, and it's a rain suit and it's all held together with fish glue, so you don't worry about that. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> now, what else are your web bots picking up, like uh, some other key linguistics that you think would be important to, to let us know about? Well, keep getting all kinds of weird stuff about, um, uh, well, okay, the things we need to worry about are all economic because we've got a bunch of bozos in charge. The interesting things for me, though, are all the weird woo-woo stuff coming in because at some point this year, we're going to start having that collision of woo-woo uh, meets economics. And uh, hopefully it'll come on out, it'll all come out well for us as humans in the what, end. Can I jump in real quick, Cliff, just sure. so people know? What's your take or definition of woo-woo so people know because I, I think I know but sure woo-woo is all of the stuff that's officially denied and officially unknown as well as really unknown stuff we really don't know so quanta uh, physics is an attempt to understand some part of woo-woo you know that kind of thing but okay. UFO UFOs and UFO ufology is also an attempt to understand one part of woo-woo but it's all all lumped in there I, I take the term as a a bastardization of a phrase from um, Captain Ron uh, in the in that movie where he talks about, well, this is the Caribbean folks, a uh, land of <laughs> hoodoo, voodoo, and all kinds of strange, and then that's where I put in woo-woo. <laughs> Perfect. That's a good film. It's a very excellent, yeah. And and really, see, that's, you know, it's all the stuff that's uh, officially unknown and um, and officially denied because there's a whole lot of stuff that's officially denied and not unknown at all. They've, they've, you know, more than scratched the surface on it. And we know this from all of the stuff that's leaked out everywhere for, you know, 40 years, 50 years. T. Townsend Brown was working on, you know, electro-antigravitics uh, in the 50s and was very successful. So what have they done in the intervening 50 years? That kind of thing. And so it's, you know, the but the woo-woo, so in that sense, uh, woo, woo might include uh, arms of the military, not your regular old infantry guys, but maybe some of these things I see floating up in the sky late at night, uh, the way bricks don't, uh, with my little goggles, um, maybe those are actually military craft. So in that sense, they're woo-woo because they're certainly officially denied, uh, but yet they do exist. Okay, so that that's kind of, now you're picking up woo-woo combined with economics, you said, and that's the yeah. stuff that, okay. Okay, and see, basically what it comes down to is this. We're at a weird juxtaposition of the failing of the financial system where it's 100% based on debt. It requires, debt is funny stuff because the instant you, you pay it back, the, the money supply is reduced. The volume, the velocity of money between individuals, so its usefulness, uh, money's usefulness as a medium of exchange drops off. It becomes uh, net negative if you start paying off debt in a debt-based system with debt-based money. And that's where we are. We're in a debt-based system at its maximum level of debt with debt-based money. 
money is created by uh, of taking out loans. It doesn't come into existence from the Federal Reserve or any of this. It's always taking out loans that causes it to occur. And so this, this debt-based system is inherently built on the concept that there will always be the ability to create more debt. But at some point, the, the population becomes saturated. There's nothing more that they want enough to take on more debt for it. It's kind of like, do you really want to take on an additional two or $3,000 debt on your credit card to get the latest and greatest version of the Who's He Was It device? Probably there will be some people, but the majority of us start dropping off. And so the debt system starts corroding and falling and crumbling at the edges. And the problem is it'll reach a core and then the whole system just collapses. And we're very close to the crumbling up here reaching that core and causing the whole system to collapse because there's not enough velocity of money to keep the debt structure alive, right? It's basically um, uh, can be encapsulated on the, on the saying that we're used to be familiar with in my generation of, we'll make it up in volume. <laughs> it, was a, it was always a, you know, kind of pre predicated, well, we're only losing 16 cents a, a unit as we produce these, but we'll make it up in volume. Um, you know, right. that kind of thing. But, but there is no more volume, right? We can't keep the illusion alive unless there is the volume to, to do so. And so people are dropping out of the system. The participation rate in the labor force is falling. Uh, people don't have disposable uh, income. They don't want to buy stuff. There isn't enough of uh, anything to generate enough of a desire for them to get off their butt to go and try and find a job, even if one existed, in order to buy the stuff because they just don't want it. We're all saturated with the crud. So the banksters that, that and the politicians that they own and the military structure that they both support are all desperate. Uh, to keep the thing going because it's cool for them, right? It's cool for the banksters, cool for the politicians, cool for the military guys. They get to get all this cool stuff and go bomb people, and, you know, it's all good for them. Uh, but it all depends on us creating more debt. We're, we're done with it. So uh, this is where the woo-woo part comes in. If we don't um, do something, uh, okay, now, part of the reason we have debt at the moment is because the world that, that we're in now is not the same world I was born in way back in the 50s. Way back in the 50s, you could take uh, one barrel of oil's worth of energy, and you could drill a hole in the ground if you knew where to go and look, and you get 40, 50, 60, 100, 2, 3, 4, 5,000 barrels back for every barrel you put in. And so there was a capital gain there that was plenitude being uh, given to you from the planet. And that plenitude is not there anymore. Now, when we put in a, a barrel's worth of energy into the hole in the ground, drilling for oil, if we're lucky, we get two back, maybe two in a little bit. And and that's where debt comes from in all the years of it doesn't it's not profitable to do that, to put that kind of energy into making the trucks and the drills and all this kind of stuff in order to get barely back the trucks, the trucks and the drills worth of energy. So what we've been doing in the intervening years as this has been occurring, as the oil has been sucked up and used is in our energy system is we've been living on debt. And so the debt level has been going up as the oil return has gone down. And we're at that point now where the oil return is, is about to run net negative. I think it's five to one out of shale oil. And uh, they uh, are, are, quote, profitable at that level. But, of course, it's all based on um, debt. And, unfortunately, our species isn't profitable unless we're getting at least uh, a 15 or 20 to one return uh, because of the nature of oil and how we use it and its wastage and so on. And so um, at this point, we're at kind of a juxtaposition. The economy is going to collapse in the sense of an actual monetary event um, where government won't have money to spend. Uh, there won't be ATM machines working. There won't be EBT cards working. Stores won't have goods delivered. Within a few days, gas stations won't have gas. Uh, within probably weeks, if that long, it'll be an unknown. Uh, big areas of the country will start losing electricity. And this will be because we don't have the diesel to power the trains to pull the coil, to bring the coal, to make the electricity, etc. Right? And so all these ramifications occur simply because we reach a particular point where there's a juxtaposition of all of these kind of events. And they're going to, um, it's a little rough, you know, difficult to take for us. Now, there are ways out. Uh, one of the things that occurs to me, and I'm not alone in this, I'm not the only person on the planet, not the only person on the West Coast here that has these night vision goggles. And you take these goggles out at night, you lie back in your in your deck chair when it's not raining in your face and you, won't, you don't drown. And if you, if you don't have chemtrails over your head, which is rare anymore, you can look up at, at particular times and you can see these triangular craft floating around. You can see giant, huge things the triangular craft float into and out of. And so it occurs to me, I don't see any smokestacks. Those things are not diesel powered. They're not running on coal. Whatever is driving that stuff up there belongs to us. 
and and it's being we're not being a, uh, given access to it, and we're going to need it down here because of the ice age and the conditions that we have now, and it would radically alter our society for the better to have that stuff released. Now our data had shown that there was a possibility that we were going to get to the point where there was going to be some level of what we can call disclosure uh, here this year, and that it was going to set and it was related to Antarctica, and we're still getting a lot more of that. Uh, data growing in, in the sets there. Uh, Antarctica is an interesting thing. As I, as I wrote in this upcoming report, Antarctica is unique in my work because of a strange thing that seems to have occurred there. Um, uh, so you're, uh, you're an Italian, right? You're living in Italy, uh, conditions are bad, and you move to New York City as part of a giant wave of Italian immigrants. And you move into uh, New Sicily or, you know, New Rome. Uh, then the, then you move further into the country. Every place you go, you find places that are named from the places you've been or the places near your house when you grew up. And same thing happens to the Irish. Irish guys, you know, they're potato famine. The Irish immigrate to the United States. What do they start doing as they progress further and further west? They start naming all the places around them, representing um, the, their point of origin. And so that causes problems for me because in my data sets, when we use any geographic references, it gets really difficult. You know, there's dozens of Malibus up and down the West Coast, uh, dozens of Sydneys around the, uh, the, the world. So right. you can never, never really be sure where it is, right? Antarctica is not like that. It's a weird place because the place names in Antarctica are fairly damn unique and within my work are extremely unique. So when we start getting um, geographic place name associations within the data sets for Antarctica, it's like, boom, very little ambiguity. And so this makes for a very interesting uh, situation relative to being able to pull out stuff there and or from there. And we're starting to see some of the forecasts about that show up. So Antarctica, there's so much speculation about what's going on out there. And I actually found a really cool website where this guy did independent research, and he found about a half dozen, a little bit more than a half dozen weather stations in Antarctica, and he was able to track the, the weather patterns, you know, and the temperatures. And mm -hmm. I guess since 2000, was it 2000 or 2012? I can't remember, but I, I think it's 2000. The official reports of Antarctica, as far as the weather, is not as easily available to the public. So the patterns that he showed... The weather in most uh, stations, except for two of them, had been consistently going down, not up. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, and I know that the ice shelf is supposed to be cracking off uh, as far as the uh, C. Was it shelf C? I think. No, the, the wet LC. Yeah. So, what's yeah, your take on that? Is is that okay? So, here's the deal. <laughs> okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, this, this line is, doesn't exist in reality. It only is there to hold up uh, our <laughs> globe, okay? So it's the wall that Trump built. <laughs> there you go. Well, let's actually just talk about it. Let, let me move the planet here a bit, all right? So you can actually, you can't see it from your perspective, but this ridge here that's the uh, holder represents a, a line of mountains that goes across to Antarctica. Antarctica is actually composed, without the ice, of two major land masses, except with lots of little islands in between and these uh, peninsulas. So this is one landmass here, and here is another landmass. We are indeed getting the area of the Weddell Sea getting cracks and, and ice deformation and huge giant icebergs breaking off from there, and it's my expectation that all of this area here will become ice-free relatively soon, along with this process right, along with this area right there, as the ice process continues. But what's going on is we're getting more ice forming out over here floating ice not on the uh, not on the continent so that's what's going on relative to the temperatures and why it's getting colder there's actually more ice in antarctica now but it, the ice distribution is radically different than we've seen in the past 5000 years so all the people that are going out there that are political leaders or scientists or researchers they're doing it because they i mean what do they find out there i've heard so many reports and and i don't know what to believe you know people say well there's there's giant elongated skulls and and flash frozen societies that have been discovered in antarctica and and i i think okay great well where's the evidence where's the proof right okay and i don't know about the skulls and i don't know about the societies okay but i do know and I actually have, that was gifted to me, I actually have physical proof of pyramids uh, because of a guy who was down there at a climbing expedition. And I've told this story before. I can't reveal who he is or hand out the photos. 
Uh, he, he got uh, to a situation where it was, uh, the group he was with were off the trail that they were uh, allowed to go to. Uh, the British came and scooped him up and took him out when they discovered this because they're all tagged with GPS things. Uh, but they got into, went through a pass and discovered uh, chisel marks in the pass that climbers make uh, for themselves to guide themselves to and from. So here was an area that had thousands of climbers marks in this little climbing pass and chisel points and and uh, piton attachment areas, all this kind of stuff, going back, uh, you know, eons. And uh, and when you pop out of it, there was this giant pyramid that, that had had a lot of the ice off of it uh, and had a huge giant doorway in it that was had an arch at the top and was probably 90 meters, the guy estimated, he's European, 90 meters from the base of the, of the thing up to the top of the arch and maybe 40 meters wide. Uh, and there were huge stairs that, that uh, went up to it. So um, it could be that, that it was built like uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with the idea of aggrandizing self and building something monumental, and you're just really that high. Or it could be that it was built by some, you know, <laughs> big son of a bitch. <laughs> we don't know. But so I, I do have a picture of, the, of uh, this. under. It was given to me in the year 2000, uh, so way back when. Uh, so I knew things were a little bit uh, strange then. Now we're getting more and more evidence of it all the time. Uh, pyramids are showing up. There's a lot of a lot of evidence of a lot of pyramids around the planet that are popping up now, and in uh, academic circles where the archaeology is not forbidden, it's not forbidden to find a pyramid, right? The way it is forbidden to come across a UFO. So, if, for instance, if I'm digging in my backyard and I find a pyramid, the government, maybe the Smithsonian, might get all bent out of shape by it, uh, but they won't throw me in jail for it. There might be some negotiation to get me to keep my mouth shut. But if I were to find a UFO there, boy, that's instant. One year in jail. <laughs> no deal, no nothing. You're gone. And it's during that period of time that they make the rest of it disappear. Uh, so uh, in Antarctica, we've got something that is taking in thousands of people and thousands of jobs. So if you want, you can find work now uh, here in these United States by looking for jobs in Antarctica. And there's jobs for cooks. There's jobs for welders, mechanics. Uh, jobs for scientists, jobs for instrumentation uh, calibration people, uh, all kinds of, of, of work there. And so it begs the question, what really is going on? We do have the reports of the pyramids that are somewhat substantiated. I, I, I feel comfortable going so far as to say that it's, it sure seems like Antarctica was the um, a hotbed of the pyramid culture, if not a point of origination. Uh, beyond that, uh, that, that implies an ancient society. Uh, and a lot of other stuff, but I don't have any proof or anything in the data that say, you know, uh, people with elongated skulls um, being found in Antarctica. I do have I do have a lot of weird stuff about Antarctica, but but it's all in the woo range, right? Uh, we do have stuff about archaeology uh, showing up in Antarctica. So uh, there may be, um, you know, the idea of the um, uh, really outlandish stuff of finding a lot of dead people and that, you know, they're giants and uh, have elongated skulls and so on uh, may well be the, the case. But within the data sets, we don't actually have anything that says ex explicitly that.